Their job is to create sections of pipe called double joints, each 24 meters long. There's a lot at stake. The pipes have to be put together so there's no chance of leakage. And the assembly line has to keep up a steady pace. The entire operation is monitored by engineers who have video cameras that watch the process both inside and outside the pipe. It's incredible technology, but the, the fundamentals are very simple. The fundamental thoughts that go behind it, because it has to be so rugged and it has to work every time, first time, that the actual basic engineering is still fairly simple. The next stage of the assembly line is to join this short section of pipe to the main pipeline. It's fed out of the back end of the ship and onto the sea floor. It's a complex process that requires a lot of fine-tuning. This is no ordinary welding operation. The process involves a special welding machine with eight heads per station. Passing through each of the welding stations in seven minutes, the pipe is then checked by an ultrasound machine. If a flaw is detected, it has to be repaired immediately before moving on to the next station. The process can't be stopped, and the connection has to be perfect, because this is the stage that welds them together forever. The assembly line is manned by industrial workers from over 30 countries. Shifts work around the clock to keep the assembly moving 24 hours a day. Each day, the teams have to assemble three to four kilometers of pipeline and drop it to the sea floor. After the welding stations have linked the pipe, the final step of the operation is to seal the exposed metal. It's covered in a protective heat-shrunk plastic. Without this, the steel pipe would corrode in the seawater. Then it's time for the most critical step of the operation, offloading the pipe to the sea floor. The section where the pipes are joined is covered in foam to protect the welded joint during the drop. The decks are cleared, and the pipe is ready to be committed to the sea floor. A rubber tensioner grips the pipeline and holds it in place as it slides off the barge. As the pipe enters the ocean, it begins to sag, and pressure is put on the entire pipeline, which is free hanging beneath the ship. Without exactly the right tension, the pipe could snap. The pipe comes off the back of the barge in what's called a lazy S. Uh, configuration. So it comes off the, off the back of the barge and is, and is dra trails down to the seabed some distance behind. That S of unsupported pipe has to be kept from just buckling under its own weight. So to keep it under control, you've got to keep that under a huge tension to stop it from just collapsing under its own weight. As the pipe is lowered, the barge moves forward exactly 24 meters. With this well-oiled operation, the LB200 is able to lay over 100 kilometers of pipeline a month, as long as the pathway is clear. But clearing that pathway is a complicated process. In these particular sections of the pipeline route, a two-meter deep trench is required. So engineers bring in the massive Saipem plow. This is the PL2. It's being used for trenching in shallower waters. It drops onto the seabed over the one meter diameter pipe where its strong clamps pick it up. 
Then, as the surface ship pulls it forward, the plough cuts a trench five metres wide and two metres deep. To fill the trench, the BPL-2 follows behind with backfill to cover the pipe with a protective coating of sand. Early in the design phase, engineers decided to bring the gas from the Orman Lang field to the processing plant at Ni Handa and then build another 1,200 km pipeline to Britain. At the 600 km mark, the line is broken and connected to the Sleipner riser platform. The Sleipner platform works as a hub, monitoring the 70 million cubic meters of gas flowing into the UK every day. But tying the pipeline to the platform creates a whole new set of engineering headaches. The underwater robots line up the pipeline and the connecting pipes coming from the platform. A massive underwater crane moves them into position. But when they're matched up, there's no technology that can replace human beings in making the final connection. So the welders also have to become divers. You ready to come down? Your hose good? Okay, he's ready to come down. Thank you. The divers move around the worksite in pressurized modules, welding on the sea floor. Do one lift on it, see if we can rotate it into its proper orientation with you guys. Oh. Hey, you're, you're clear of that, Dearman? New edges have to be cut and beveled at each pipe end before the welding hub is lowered onto the joint to connect the two sections. The welding habitat is dropped to the ocean floor, then maneuvered in place perfectly over the one meter diameter pipe. It clamps the pipe and then closes itself off. The habitat is pumped full of air, forcing the water out. On the surface, the dive supervisor uses cameras to keep a close eye on the underwater team and watch for any danger. Once it's safe, the divers move from the module to the welding habitat. Within this habitat, the diver welders make the final permanent connection. It's a tricky and dangerous procedure. The welders are confined to this small room 72 meters down, and there's no escape if something goes wrong. Then we inch down to six o'clock with the weldhead. As each weld is finished, the engineer checking by monitor on the ship above is able to inspect the work. This last weld completes the connection from Easington to the Sleipner gas platform, halfway from Norway. This is the first of many underwater welds they'll need to make all the pipe connections and get the gas flowing. 600 kilometers of pipe still have to be completed, but a major goal has been achieved with this connection. A mysterious shipwreck has been found 500 meters off the coast, lying in their path, and there's no way round it. The wreck is directly in the path of the pipeline, and the engineers have no choice but to halt work. They look for alternate routes, but the underwater terrain near the coast prevents the pipeline from going around or under it. So they have to go through it. But before they do that, they decide to study the wreck and recover as many artifacts as they can. The problem is that the shipwreck lies in over 200 meters of water, well beyond the reach of archaeological divers. Marek Jasinski is a professor of marine archaeology. His team is called in to research the wreck 500 meters from the harbor. I don't think they were really happy when they found out that there was a sh shipwreck uh, lying in the way. It may have stopped the pipeline in its tracks, but for archaeologists, this is a fantastic opportunity to excavate and retrieve a piece of history. But it's hard enough doing a proper archaeological excavation in shallow water. At these depths, it's considered nearly impossible. 
So the team takes a lead from the Orman Lang engineers and uses ROVs to do the archaeological recovery for them. These vehicles now become new generation tools for the archaeologists. But the thrusters on the ROVs stir up sediment and obscure the wreck site. So the archaeologists devise a way to put an ROV on site and move it around without thrusters. The ROV docks to this steel frame, which covers a section of the wreck. Once attached, gears and pulleys control its movement with precision, and the archaeologists can get on with the job of unraveling the mystery of the shipwreck. Our theory is that the ship was on its way to northern Russia, to Arkhangelsk, and that this ship was a part of the trade network between West Europe and Northern Russia. The find is amazing. They discover 18th century artifacts from Asia, the Mediterranean, and all over Europe. Once the sand is cleared, fully intact wine bottles, plates, and coins are collected by the remote operated vehicles. Back in the lab, the finds are investigated. The archaeologists may never know the name of the ship these artifacts come from, but it's an extraordinary opportunity to look into maritime history, an opportunity that may never have arisen had the Orman Lang pipeline not stumbled upon the wreck. Meanwhile, in Nihamna, they now have to deal with the raw gas that comes out of the Orman Lang field. What comes through the pipeline is not pure gas. It contains large chunks of debris called slugs. The slugs move through the pipeline with such force that when they reach the treatment plant on land, they have the potential to explode like liquid bombs. And they will come into the plant with quite high velocity and a lot of mass in it. So if those came into the plant directly, it would probably destroy the plant. The solution is to build a slug catcher, a labyrinth of pipes and filters this 10,000-ton monster will meet the debris and stop it in its tracks before it reaches the Nihamna plant. Now the engineers have to contend with millions of cubic meters of condensate. Every major gas producer ends up with condensate, a valuable stew of raw materials that can be turned into other types of energy. The problem is storing it and then moving it. The solution here is to use huge underground caverns carved inside the Norwegian mountains. This enormous natural holding tank can be filled with 230,000 cubic meters of condensate. And the engineers don't have to line the rock caverns with anything. Water pressure from the surrounding area forces the toxic sludge to stay confined within the walls. Every four days, the caverns are pumped dry, and freighters haul away more than 24,000 cubic meters of condensate. This byproduct is a sort of liquid gold, which can be turned into other types of fuel for the international marketplace. As the Nihamna gas plant is completed, the final leg of pipe is laid out to the Orman Lang gas field, 120 kilometers offshore. A special ship is required to work in these dangerous waters close to the Norwegian coastline. It can maneuver in tight spots using dynamic positioning, moving meter by meter from shore to the Orman Lang gas field. Out here near the gas field, the solitaire reaches the limit of its pipe-laying ability and can go no further. Its job comes to an end at the top of the Storega slide. This is the most demanding part of the entire Orman Lang project. The steep terrain left in the wake of the Storega landslide requires a special pipe-laying ship. This is the S-7000, a former crane ship that's been modified with a 130-meter tower on its stern deck. It's now taller than a 33-story building. It's a floating factory, and one so big that it's easy to forget it's 100 kilometers offshore in the North Sea. <laughs> 